CSR NIO in testing of various uh, products and uh, uh, sir, we are going to offer the services to the industry. So we, we have developed the uh, expertise in testing of the environmental testing of the products used uh, for to combating oil spill, drilling, drilling, uh, drilling of oil and other other uh, other treating the other uh, uh, the environmental contaminants. So this this uh, this event uh, will showcase our expertise and also we want to know from the industry what sort of uh, requirement they have in addition to that what expertise uh, CSNN at the moment is having. So in, in this connection, I would like to present on the environmental testing of drilling fluids, uh, which over the years uh, we have developed the expertise in this one. Earlier, uh, I, I, I recall that maybe five, five, six years back, all the the Reliance, Total, Total Oil and other uh, other oil, oil companies, they used to send their sample to USA to get their uh, the samples analyzed. So in a, in a one form or other, we started this Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, program so, so that all the testing can be done in NIO, uh, see in India itself, uh, particularly in CSR NIO. And in addition to that, we have also attracted many many of the foreign oil, oil, oil uh, de dealing with oil refineries, oil companies to get that environmental testing done at NIO. So this uh, showcases our expertise available here in NIO. So in this connection, I would like to make a presentation. What are the tests are involved and how, how the testing is done so, so that the industries get a confidence to 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 give us more more projects and we want to there invite there in the into our business portfolio yeah uh, this is a brief brief introduction about our institute overview activities and uh, in, uh, active achievements of CSR and IO. Uh, uh, our our mission is to CSR one of the laboratories 36 laboratories of the council of scientific industrial research and I was founded in uh, 1966, followed by International Indian Ocean Expedition. IAO is the largest international collaborative oceanographic program. The 36 ships from the dozen countries participated. I think I'll slowly move on to the topic now. Uh, keeping in view of the uh, national, lab uh, national laboratory dedicated to oceanography, we need to strike the balance between science and applications. So a lot of science also is being done in form of ocean science, the different fields of ocean science and it applications and applications is one, one of the application application oriented is to provide the technical services to the industries because based on our uh, report or test report, the industries can able to use the product and also they can get the uh, uh, regular approval from the regulatory authorities. So our mission statement is that continuously improve our understanding of the seas around, in, around us and to translate this knowledge to benefit all. So th this is very important of in keeping the, uh, the, the harmful products entering into the marine environment. So first, uh, first is that uh, we, uh, as I said, that we, we, in addition to basic research work, uh, we are also involved in uh, applied oceanographic research in the form of a contract, uh, contract research projects. First demarcation of ONGC submarine of oil pipeline were routes for demark 1976-77. We also offer a lot of consultancy services, environmental impact assessment studies and environmental monitoring programs, bathymetry, seabed engineering and CRJ demarcation, evaluation design parameters for coastal and offshore. Why I'm highlighting is most of the parameter, most of the studies are interrelated with the, uh, they also involve the environmental testing of the products. Uh, consultancy, we also do the uh, site selection for marine outfall. Uh, th this is very important for us. We, we are doing the uh, toxicity testing of the uh, waste uh, treated effluent and waste water before it is getting into the uh, sea. Uh, on SPM numerical modeling studies, this this data will be combined with the toxicity studies, uh, so, so, so that we know the uh, the the point of discharge of this one is not harming the marine environment. Oil spill risk analysis it also involves the testing of the oil spill uh, dispersion products, in which my colleague Dr. Prabha Devi we will be touching on, touching upon now. Biofueling and uh, corrosion studies and underwater surveys also our institute takes place, undertakes. Yeah. 
Uh, so we also do the, as I said, that environmental testing of the treated industrial effluents. So a lot of industries are re uh, releasing the their treated or partially treated industrial effluents. So we do the prior uh, toxicity testing using the uh, using the all the uh, uh, as per the regulatory guidelines. Uh, most of the industrial effluent deal with the pharmaceutical, textile, steel paper and pulp industries also thermal effluents heated heated effluents from thermal power plants so this data whatever we get from the toxicity studies it will be come it will be taken into numerical modeling studies and ultimately the the point of discharge will be will be identified and informed to the is one so we we are the as 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 i told earlier that evaluation of oil spill dispersant also this we, we are the we are, i'm happy to inform that uh, we, uh, csr now is a testing laboratory approved by the Indian Coast Guard. So there are many companies in including abroad also is getting their product tested. I think in detail, Dr. Prabhadevi will, will, will inform us. Uh, see the environment testing of drilling fluids. There are two types of drilling fluids, water-based drilling fluids, non-aqueous based drilling fluids. Oil-based drilling fluids have come up now based, based on fluid, diesel, mineral water. Synthetic more, more less, less toxic and more efficient are the synthetic based drilling fluids. So they are all uh, having the using the technology gas to liquid uh, technology. Uh, components of a drilling fluid is, is the barite and uh, NAF barite where various chemicals are used. So we CSRNF has got the capabilities to uh, testing of environmental testing of these individual components as as well as a whole uh, drilling fluid. Uh, drilling fluid or drilling mud is used in oil exploration both onshore and offshore to increase the enhance uh, this one. Uh, to reduce the uh, friction and to increase the oil recovery of this one. Many of the uh, drilling fluids also used again and again. Some of while doing the drilling of the oil, oil and gas, a lot of drilling fluid also gets into the, uh, goes into the uh, marine environment. So where the testing of the drilling fluid, which is going to the marine environment becomes of paramount importance. Uh, environmental impacts of drilling fluids uh, is a toxicity to marine biota. That is the first thing. There is also uh, what I mentioned earlier. So many components are there. They are they are not some of them may may not be biodegradable. So that testing also will be done at CSR and IO whether they are, they are biodegradable, biodegradable both aerobically as as well as non non aerobically. Uh, Leachability test also we are doing how much is being leached into the water column once it is uh, entered into the seawater. Uh, Bioaccumulation, bioconcentration of drilling fluid, marine food chain. So many of the compounds which we which when when they discharge into the environment also can enter into the food chain. So we are studied by how much we are exposing in laboratory studies. We are exposing certain uh, certain amount of uh, uh, drilling fluid and ch checking the how many how much has been uh, retained. These are all used. We are also using st standard uh, procedures. USCPA, OECD guidelines, uh, and also smothering of accumulated drilling fluids also will, will be tested to see the how much benthos, uh, benthic fauna getting affected. So there are there may be a tainting of the important fish fishes, uh, fish species also there when we are having exposed when the fishes get exposed to oil pollution. So that also can be done actually to test the uh, how, how much is oil in the fish species. Uh, sediment anoxia as a result of organic matter enrichment also happens. This also can be done. Mm -hmm. The accidental spillage or offshore activities. So marine water it goes, oxygen depletion and fishes death, reproduction also affects affects the insulating ability, mammals, birds. So everybody knows what is the impact of the oil, oil as well as from the drilling fluids also have a same impact as well as as compared to the oil also. Uh, toxicity contributing factors for the oil, uh, for the drilling fluids are the chemistry of the mud formulation, what, else, what, what sort of mud, uh, what sort of ingredients they have used for the formulation of mud. Uh, to, to be again, uh, again clarified, drilling mud and drilling uh, fluid are same. Drilling fluid is the uh, one we, which is going to supply to the customers there while using the, they call it a mud, drilling fluid. So including drilling fluid, I told us, right? So inefficient toxic, inefficient separation of toxic. So we are not able to, when, 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 when it is used in a wholesome drilling mud. So it is very difficult to separate the, uh, which are the toxic components and non, non-toxic components. So if we here, we are, that's why we are using the whole drilling mud, what has 
must be individual drilling uh, individual components which is used for the mud formulation also can be tested separately so characteristics of the drilling cuttings also we we are able to tell that what is the, what what is the characteristic of drilling flu cuttings when they have, see we have done some work for ongc also uh, environmental testing requirements as per the mandatory for us epa oecd guidelines internationally recognized guidelines so we have we have established the protocols and uh, the animals test animals test design everything as per the international that's why we could able to attract the industries involved in the oil oil and gas from uh, for example C uh, sk energy total oil and other companies worldwide so we, recently we have done also done for other indian uh, psu companies also uh, echo toxicity is a uh, lc50 this acute toxicity test this is a short term and chronic also 7 day and 28 days sediment toxicity all this uh, we we have got the facilities and algal, algal growth inhibition test biodegradability as i told aerobic and anaerobic after aerobic biodegradability the drilling fluids also can bio, can also go into the anaerobic mode so that also we are able to testing and the ph poly polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons bio accumulation so we we are able to test the 16 a us pa us epa uh, content of 16 us uh, 16 ph compounds and bio accumulation potential also so we are here we are exposing the test animals to the known quant quantity of this one then we are estimating the amount of uh, accumulated in the body Ecotoxicity, uh, ecotoxicity base. We are doing both, uh, both as well as uh, this one. What is called water accommodative fraction as well as uh, suspended particle phase, particulate phase. Many of the this one when when they discharge into the water body, uh, sea water, it will form into both as uh, sediment uh, particle phase as well as a uh, water accommodative phase. So here we are doing separation and then we we are analyzing. See, this is not required. Uh, so these are the test species uh, which we have standardized against the uh, uh, known amount of uh, drilling fluids. Uh, one is the uh, this one, what is Ines monodon uh, that is available all over the all over the Indian coast. So we have the the these test species has been uh, standardized with a known uh, and it has found to be sensitive. And uh, one more uh, sensitive fish species is the gray mullet. They are highly vulnerable to the, uh, the to, uh, the, the environmental contaminants and also glass perch also very well this this why why we are selected is that they are based on so many criteria they are they are actually vulnerable to the uh, toxic toxic compounds as well as easy to breed and rare and availability of the animals available of the species animals correct size and from the hatchery so if you choose any other species which is not available and not standardized so th there will be a uh, there will be a uh, what is match in the data or error in the data so he, this is a sample of how how that that water color co column toxicity is done and uh, this is the, how the sediment toxicity has been conducted and uh, sediment toxicity species as i told morning uh, that amphiford uh, is one of the known uh, uh, known sensitive species for sediment toxicity test so here earlier i would like to say that here it is one of the most standard organism so for this we have st we have standardized the culture technique for this so we we, are, we can able to re reproduce to be used for sediment toxicity test anywhere in the world and also this um, uh, clam also used and then one more is the mud skipper and the Tablet. So these are the standard organisms uh, to be tested for against drilling fluid by US EPA and OECD guidelines and also Australian guidelines for environmental safety. This is the algal growth inhibition test. How much algae uh, algal growth has been uh, has been affected? So this is a plat drill oil. Uh, this is used by that company in uh, Malaysia. So here we are using the chloral chloral vulgaris as a test. Also, we can use a skeletonoma uh, costatum. This is a biodegradability test. Aerobic biodegradability. We are keeping for 20 days and measuring the how much uh, oxygen is remaining at the end. Of. This is a test substance and the reference of substance. How much is the biodegradability happened? We can able to. So everybody, the, most of the this one they specify should be not less than 60 percent. So these are the test animals which are used for toxicity. These are the inhibition test. This is the protocols, USCP methods, and all. 
this is an uh, we also doing the sbf means suspended base fluids suspended uh, sorry uh, synthetic base fluids uh, synthetic base fluids are the base fluid which is used to make the mud so we can test both the oil as well as the mud also so these are our uh, te uh, testing clients so this this is and this is ending uh, more uh, more these are there we have done so we are doing the ongc standard also we are one of the uh, uh, testing laboratory so we 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 also want to expand this uh, into other areas uh, thank you sir for your attention so any questions are there from audience are there any questions Director, sir, do you want to give any remarks? Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. So, uh, I want to ask you, sir, one question. As uh, you mentioned that you are doing a lot of uh, these tests for different drilling fluids from India. Hmm. So, are you getting any samples from abroad or uh, what any special approvals are required if they want to contact you? Uh, no, this. no. We we are also we have done uh, we have done six projects. One, two from Malaysia, uh, one from uh, this Korea, South Korea, and also we have done one for Singapore as well as Saudi Arabia. So testing is not required. So we have to once the foreign company approaches, since we have to take the security sensitivity clearance from our CSR headquarters. So it may take time, and then uh, we have to sign a sam sampling analysis agreement, so that they are giving sample and we are giving their report. So that is a standard uh, standard procedure. Sampling analysis agreement will be signed after we get the security sensitivity clearance from the CSR. So most of the clients will be charged in US dollars. So that is the normal practice which we have been doing. They are also very competitive compared to earlier. They were testing with the other uh, USA, France, and all their company. Our rates are highly competitive. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, sir. So let us now. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Sir, very happy uh, that uh, mm -hmm. NIO is doing a lot of environmental services uh, for decades, and uh, even our college, College of Fisheries. Uh, is monitoring coastal waters for last 35 years. So now we, we have shown the indicators and the physical parameters. So we somewhere we have to come out with uh, models, regression models, so that we can predict the future very easily. Otherwise, at once we go test and that cannot be equated or used as a model. So somewhere we have to tabulate all the information gathered for last three decades. We have to come out with uh, some scientific models. Yeah, yeah. You no. Know, in this connection, we uh, we have got that Mike 21, This model is there. Okay. If we have some data and all, we can able to run in our in our institute and come out with a prediction. Um, what will be the happening or what are the where the uh, toxic tox, toxicant are moving or where the accumulation is taking place based on the, the physical parameters, physical physical parameters. We can able to, if you, if you have a data, just show us to us, we'll, we'll discuss, we, we can put in the, this one, there are many models are there. No, this is very recently at Padubidri Blue Flag Beach, yeah. there was a R4 algal bloom of Nautiluca. So you showed the chlorella. So based on their uh, periodic abundance, we should be able to predict the Health of the coastal waters, something like that. You know, I got the point. We look together. We, we have to do the testing first. We have to be, unfortunately, we don't have any baseline data. If this is not to bloom, what will happen? Something so, like some laboratory studies has to be done, come out with this one, then we can feed the data into my 21 model. It will generate the. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Come back. Interesting question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. So, let us now move to the plenary talks. In the first, we have Dr. Prabha Devi, who will be talking on environmental testing of products used in combating oil pollution. Dr. Prabha Devi is a principal technical officer at the Chemical Oceanography Division of CSIR NIO. She has a PhD in marine science and more than 17 years of research experience in various aspects of marine sciences, biotechnology, and natural product research. She has more than 32 publications and three postdocs two EMBO and one DBT-CRES from DBT. 
to her credit she has carried out around 15 sponsored project for testing oil spill products in addition to the above she has also followed the prime minister's atmanirbhar program and voluntarily prepared sanitizer by following the who recipe for the institute during the time of covid-19 pandemic she was appreciated for her work with the award of appreciation by our director sir of csir and io with this brief info- introduction i request dr prabha devi to make her presentation on the topic environmental testing of products used in combating oil pollution over to you dr prabha ma'am we are not able to hear her hello am i audible yes ma'am now here thank you sir thank you dr supriya for your kind introduction uh, very good afternoon to everybody now the main objective now uh, the most uh, the important objective of this program is to strengthen collaboration between research organization and industrial partners okay in view of this i will make a very brief presentation as to how we at the national institute of oceanography we test products for combating oil spill causing oil pollution now the oil spill is a major concern why because it seems to affect all the water bodies like the rivers bays oceans thus you know endangering uh, marine life now currently it is seen that uh, oil spills are attracting a lot of attention especially when uh, you know there is a voluminous amount of oil introduced uh, into the marine uh, environment uh, due to accidental spillage from uh, barges uh, then uh, tankers then oil uh, pipelines uh, refineries then uh, drilling operation in rigs and uh, you know improper storage facilities now in addition to all these factors the natural sources and recreational activities also play their part to uh, you know add to this oil pollution now here i have listed out some of the techniques for the cleanup methods 
Now, um, by uh, using um, oil booms. Now, this is a very popular and a straightforward method. It's still very much in use. As can be seen here, two boats, two boats, uh, they tow the boom uh, along uh, in the region of the spill and uh, and in the region of the spill, thus uh, preventing the uh, the spillover of the oil uh, into the neighboring regions. Now you can see that once the layer of oil is big enough, then uh, we can use oil skimmers, uh, which uh, for vacuum or siphoning the oil into various containers of different sizes or shapes uh, to be to be you know uh, um, transported back to the shore for uh, recovery. Now, these mechanical processes are a very efficient process and, you know, they are still in use, as I already mentioned, and um, these are very efficient, especially when the, the spills are accessible to you within a very short time period, like within a few hours of the spill, uh, if you uh, get an opportunity to, uh, to treat oil, then this is the best method, and also during calm waters. However, in the case of um, rough seas, when there is a strong um, waves and the wind velocity is very high, then this process, this method may not be very uh, applicable. Now, this is another figure in which uh, you can, which is taken from an old technical report and here you can see how that inflatable boom uh, is moved around the sunken wreck and in order to maintain the oil spill within that particular area uh, so that uh, now the next is using uh, sorbents now there are certain materials which have the ability to adsorb oil onto the surfaces now this material they adsorb oil and frequently this material is retrieved and the oil is recovered however if we uh, if the time required for retrieving the sorbent is delayed then the material as well as the oil becomes so heavy that it may sink to the seabed and thus uh, causing um, you know um, uh, still a further disaster uh, then uh, the next is in situ burning of oil. Now this in situ burning of oil helps to remove around 98% of the oil compared to the other methods. However, this method is uh, highly not recommended. I'm, I repeat, this method is not recommended because it uh, emits a lot of toxic uh, fumes and, uh, and pollutants into the air, causing not only the air pollution and also indirectly the uh, marine pollution. Now, if uh, any of these above methods cannot be used for some reason or the other the next option which is left to us is the use of the efficient um, uh, chemical uh, agents called dispersants now what are dispersants dispersants are nothing but surfactants surfactants like soaps uh, dissolved in a suitable solvent now, uh, just like the name suggests, surfactants means the surface active agents. Now, these surface active agents, they, what they do is they reduce the surface tension or the interfacial tension between the, uh, between the oil and water. Now, uh, as can be seen, the structure of a surfactant consists of a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. I can also say it consists of a lipophilic uh, tail. So now this hydrophilic head contains uh, groups which can be non-ionic, it can be anionic, it can be cationic, or it can be amphoteric. Now, um, now what happens is when a dispersant is sprayed on the oil, the oil film is broken down and you get uh, numerous small oil droplets which are called the micelles now the schematic representation of a micelle is as shown the, this uh, here uh, now you can see how the oil globule is uh, acted upon by the uh, surfactant and how um, uh, the arrangement of the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic uh, portions are attached to the uh, missiles. Now, these missiles have properties which are very different from that of the oil. In the case of oil, which are sticky and light, they form a film on the surface of water. And now this film is sticky. And when it becomes a thick film, it's called a sleek. Now, this sleek prevents the transport of air, um, you know, the uh, transport of air, uh, air gases um, between the hydrosphere and the atmosphere. And uh, this um, uh, this, you know, may cause anoxic condition in the marine environment and cause uh, fish kill. 
however, the missiles are just opposite in properties, as I already mentioned. They repel each other, so they do not form a film on the surface. In fact, they, uh, they are distributed not only on, restricted on the surface, but uh, all along the water column. Now, after understanding the structure of the, uh, the surfactant and the nature of the missile, we can easily understand uh, how the working of an OSD takes place. Now, uh, here you can see um, there was an oil spill. There's a sleek formed. Now there is aerial um, spraying of the dispersant. The dispersant is um, transferred into several oil droplets called missiles. Now these missiles are distributed all along the water column. There are thousands or millions of microbes which is present in the water column, which are waiting to digest these missiles by using them as a carbon source, acting as food and as energy for the microbes. Now these decomposed missiles, as well as the bacteria, are you know fed upon by the protozoans and the nematodes which are present in the water column. So now you can see how beautifully with Within uh, four weeks to seven weeks, the uh, dispersant can do its job. Now, if I say that a dispersant is efficient, I mean to say that the dispersant can uh, efficiently, uh, you know, uh, break up the oil sleek into uh, missiles. And now, um, meaning that the OSD is efficient. Now, for an OSD to be stable. Uh, that um, the missile has to remain long enough time in the water column to be acted upon by the microbes. Now, after understanding this working of uh, OSD, uh, I will show you how, what are the following uh, the specifications to be followed for an OSD. Now, it has to be in the liquid form, no doubt, and it has to be uh, it has to form a clear homogeneous solution. Then, some of the prohibited ingredients in the uh, in the OSD should be benzene. And then, it should be devoid of carbon tetrachloride. Then, uh, chlorinated hydrogen hydrocarbons, phenols, you know, salts, alkali, and acid. Now, presence of any one of these compounds can increase the toxicity of the OSD. Now, it should also have less than 3% of aromatic hydrocarbons. Then it should be stable between 0 to 50 degrees. It should have a self shelf life of five years. It should have a, a flash point of minimum 60 degrees. And again, uh, efficiency, efficiency should be greater than 60% and stability greater than 50%. And of course, it should be non-toxic. Uh, a little about the toxicity screening, I will explain uh, uh, after a few more slides. Now, the policies and guidelines which is, uh, you know, used for selecting an OSD. Now, there are various uh, reading materials and protocols which is present online and which is easily accessible. Now, the, the Bible we use is uh, the Indian Coast Guard ICT 2009, especially if you are using an OSD uh, for, to be treated in Indian waters. And now uh, coming to uh, toxicity screening, we use live organisms, either fish or shrimps. We also use uh, microalgae or we use, uh, you know, bivalves. Now, what we do is first we estimate the mortality rate. From the percent mortality, we calculate the lethality. The lethality LC50 is described, is defined as the concentration required to kill 50% of the organism within the known time period. It can be 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 or 96. Now, from the LC50 values, you compare the, them with the toxicity criterion, which is already present in the protein. Protocols. Now, depending on these LC, uh, toxicity criterion uh, comparison, we can, uh, you know, we can uh, identify whether the OSD is toxic or non-toxic for commercial use. Now, uh, if uh, now to uh, summarize, we have to choose appropriate method for combating oil spills using different know-how. In the sense, you have to know when the oil was spilled, how much area it was it has spread, and where it has been spilled. Uh, with all this information, you can you have to choose the most appropriate method. Secondly, uh, combination of mechanical and chemical treatment may be most useful for treating uh, oil spills. Now, um, it is necessary that an OSD, which is to be used, should be efficient, it should be stable, and it should be non-toxic. Now, NIO has been testing OSD since 1995, and uh, still we extend our uh, services for such testing. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Prabha. 
uh, uh, sir, do you have some yeah, questions? Yeah. Ma'am, uh, with due respect, uh, why there was no mention about the biotechnological approaches? So this uh, OSD testing, no, we don't use any biotechnological application. No, no, just, because uh, uh, now bioremediation or biodeterioration, where you use microbes for degrading oil. Mentioned only OSD, that's all. We mention only OSD testing. Just before it is used for treating oil spills. But beyond that, is NIO doing anything? NIO is doing something because now we have bioremediation or degradation processes where you use marine microbes you know, for uh, treating oils, but this cannot be used by companies because it is very uh, know, time consuming. I know, I know all that. The research aspect, yes, we do. We have a consortium of bacterium. And uh, about the title, uh, just only uh, for uh, this, my understanding, instead of my environmental testing of products, testing of environmental products would be better, right usage. Environmental testing is a wrong usage. Please change it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prabha. Yeah. Once again, I will, I will, I would like to respond to your that uh, other question. Uh, this we are doing the testing as per the need. Okay, if the clients want to ask, uh, want to do some biotechnology approaches and all, we can we can able to extend our uh, expertise to them. So oh, this okay. is the correct, correct, correct. Hmm. Okay, see in oil pollution management, OSD is one of the components. So in total, we have to understand the biotechnological tools, mechanical management, and cutting the issue at the source, policy, all of them have to be understood in total. In total. That's all uh, my understanding. Anyway, I'm not confused. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prabhadevi and Dr. Magda for putting your comments. So in this uh, next plenary talk, we have Dr. Mahua Saha. Dr. Mahua Saha is a principal scientist from Chemical Oceanography Division of CSIR NIO. She has done her PhD from United Graduate School of Agricultural Science, Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology, Japan, in the research area of environmental science. She received MAXT scholarship in 2005 from Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology under Japanese government. Her research area is mainly focuses on the study of microplastic in Indian Ocean, including coastal, estuarine, open ocean in all the matrices like water, sediment and biota. In addition, she works on the assessment of or organic micropollutants and plasticizer in microplastics and microbial degradation of microplastics. She is a peer reviewer of international journal like Journal of Hazardous Materials, Environmental Monitoring and Assessment, Environmental Science and Technology, Science of Total Environment, Environmental Science and Pollution Research. She received Best Research Paper Award, that is a gold medal in the second international conference in, on ecotoxicology and environmental sciences held in Jadavpur University, Kolkata. She has total 34 number of international publications with total impact factor of 251. Dr. Mohua will be sharing her expertise on plastic and microplastics an emerging contaminant threatening to coastal and marine ecosystems. Over to you, Dr. Mohua. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tilvi, uh, for a nice uh, introduction. Uh, well, um, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, today, I'm here to uh, talk about the one of the major theme which we are actually gathering together here, that is my uh, marine litter. And um, so uh, basically I'm going to talk about the plastics and microplastics and emerging contaminants threatening to coastal and marine ecosystem. So uh, just a little brief about plastics, like it came to our life in 20th century when the revolution of the plastic era was uh, going on because of its low cost, lightweight and the moisture resistance. There are a lot of good part of plastics, it is versatile. 
But then suddenly in 2021, and in the 21st uh, century, we are in a, such a stage that we are in a plastic planet. Suddenly, we understood that whatever we have generated, it's not like we are able to control. So we are kind of uh, sitting in that uh, the huge uh, uh, problems and questions that because of the improper mismanagement, dumping of the plastic products, and that's how it it has been found in the as a plastic gyres in one of the five gyres in the world ocean. Now, if you see uh, see the scenario in India, in India we are continuously uh, developing in the plastic industry, and our production, consumption, and the waste generation is increasingly like uh, it is every year it is increasing now at present 22 million metric ton per year uh, we are seeing at uh, 2020 the production level is like such kind of thing but whereas it when it comes of consumption that we are really really now uh, used to the lot of uh, plastic consumption like 11 kg plastics per capita this is uh, from cpcv and this uh, uh, recent data is showing that India generates almost 3.5 million metric ton of plastic waste per year. In that 3 kg per year is uh, per capita waste generation. So you can imagine that how much waste we are generating in terms of the plastics. And we are not such a developed country that we have developed the waste management procedure in a very nice way, you know, which the many developing developed country has been developed. So we have to really work on that part. but. Uh, as of now, when we are seeing that when all this plastic waste are generating, it is eventually, it is gradually, it is uh, just dumping in the ocean. It is going to the ocean you know, through the several channels like rivers, is a sewage outlets. And when we are talking about like blue economy, so it is also a threat to a blue economy. Accumulation of a large number of plastics in estuaries and coasts these marine plastics adversely affect the sustainable utilization of blue economy, which is a major concern right now, what we are talking. So this is like what I said about the major macro size plastics, but is that all we are actually here? Is that all the threat which we are concerned about? No, the major concern is microplastics, which is kind of almost invisible, kind of very, very tiny, but that creates the major threat, which is the emerging threat. We have two variety of uh, microplastics we, we can categorize based on its size. So when it is coming like uh, less than uh, you know one mm, so we can say really it is tiny and it is microplastics. So primary microplastics are really a small in size, which comes from the raw materials uh, like uh, plastic resin pellets or the cosmetics, the micro beads or the microfibers, which are coming in a different kind of products. Whereas the secondary microplastics are coming after the degradation procedure, the, that could be the biodegradation or the photodegradation or the chemical degradation. When the larger size plastics are laying over the uh, beaches or, or the water bodies, it goes through the several degradation procedure and that comes the smaller size plastics are coming from the macro size plastics, which is called secondary microplastics. So this size can be varied 1 mm to 5 mm, but we are now really, really worried about the plastics which are like tiny, uh, as tiny as the one micro mm. So uh, that is uh, our major concern. So how these microplastics are coming? Obviously, several research studies are saying that uh, that this is basically land-based sources. And yes, 80 percent is coming from the land-based, and 20 percent are coming from the ocean-based. When it is coming, uh, when we are talking about the marine microplastics. So these uh, land-based sources could be the several things what I said that uh, is primary or secondary. And once it comes from the different sources, once it is in the ocean, then it is very difficult to remove. And that's how it poses the risk. Where are the risk? The risk are the particle itself is a risk. That's called particle risk. When these particles are directly taken by the different biota in a different tropic level, now, right now, we have found microplastics in every tropic level. In every stage of uh, the tropic level, every biota, we have almost uh, now uh, the research work is going on in the, all over the world. So particle itself can choke the whole system. And that's how it can possess the risk. 
and secondly it pos possesses a chemical risk because it's a good vector of uh, carrying the microplastic uh, the carrying the pollutants like pops persistent organic pollutants or it is carrying the plasticizer which is already included in this microplastics and that can be leached from these uh, particles when it is lying in the um, in, in the environment so that itself is causing a chemical risk which can cause several things like endocrine disruptions cancers and several other uh, problems in the biota and last but not the least is the um, pharmaceutical risk like uh, what pathogenic risk so this pathogenic risk is nothing because this is these microplastics are carrying the uh, you know this uh, microbes which which can be the you know really hazardous microbes those microbes can cause several kind of diseases in different level of the biota different level of the trophic level so that's how it caused the pathogenic risk and uh, all over studies are showing that in the, I, as i said in every trophic level in a, almost many of our uh, major biotas which are the major part of our main ecosystem we have found like fin fishes we have found in mussels tortoise then uh, seabirds and several other zooplanktons and uh, phytoplankton also these researches are going on so basically as i said that this microplastic is as tiny that it can enter into the even the blood cells right now research studies are showing on so that's how it, it is going to the biodiversity and uh, now we are uh, here in csr nio where we started this microplastics work Basically, we started in 2015 when this uh, laboratory has been formed, for, uh, uh, particularly on the microplastic research, where we are working on the abundance, identification, quantification, and characterization of microplastics in the different bodies of environment, like it could be the water, sediment, and different matrices. And uh, biota also we are working. We are working in a uh, several sources we are trying to find it out the sources and how these sources are working in bio it, it is coming to the biota it is how its sources are can be a threat to uh, the marine ecosystem that's our target to understand so basically when we started our research work we started from the beaches because we are in a coastal region goa uh, is in a coastal region as all of you know that's how we are start we have started uh, working on the microplastic we are we have uh, collected a lot of uh, samples, microplastic samples from the beaches. Some are primary microplastics, which is plastic resin pellets, which we picked up uh, directly with our, like, hand-picked. And uh, several microplastics have been uh, sampled uh, by using this quadrant study. And once we, are, uh, we have brought these uh, microplastics in the laboratory, we are doing the sorting, and we are doing the several research based on their size, shape, and their uh, characterization, you know, the polymer, th that is very much important to understand. That's how our first research work has been pu published in uh, 2016 in Chemosphere, where we have first shown that what kind of primary microplastics are coming uh, from different sources and how the seasonal effects are working in these microplastics, whether these microplastics are like fresh or it is degraded, how if it is degraded, how it is working. This That's how we have first work we have been done and also we have uh, shown that uh, polyethylene and polypropylene are the major uh, dominant polymer with, which we have found in our microplastics in from the beaches then eventually we have explored explored the estuaries like waters and sediments we collected the surface water by using the nets and that's also we have uh, done a lot of research work on this mandavijuari estuary and we have found several type of polymers in that polyacetylene polypropylene hdp these are the major polymers we have found you can see in this uh, research work so uh, basically what we do uh, after the processing of the sample first we count the major number of uh, microplastics you know the 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 estimated microplastic the plastic like particles which we see in the stereosome microscope that's how it shows that uh, when we are seeing in the microscopes later on in a micro ftir by using the uh, infrared techniques we just uh, identify this particular polymers so that we can understand that from which source these polymers are coming that's how our work has been uh, uh, also covered by, uh, you know, the Japanese Institute. We have been working with several, uh, uh, you know, the um, private agencies and also the government bodies like NPC, National Productivity Councils. So this is the one work we have done together collaboratively on Ganga and Yamuna River. And that's how uh, our work has been uh, uh, even uh, published in the Japanese newspaper. 
so uh, this uh, then once we are in a, we have found microplastics in the estuary and river so we, it is very important to understand from which source it is coming and what are the outlets of this microplastics when it is coming to the estuary and region that's how we lead to the our work to the uh, sewage system so when we uh, just collected our um, uh, samples from several sewage outlets, sewage points, so uh, and also the treatment plant also to understand the difference between the microplastics uh, concentration in the uh, before treatment and after treatment, and also untreated sewage when it is coming to the water body directly, how uh, how does it look? So that's how our results shows that we also found, uh, unfortunately, we found in treated plant also, after treatment also. So that means that sewage treatment plant are not that much, uh, you know, improved enough that to remove the all sort of tiny microplastics or the nanoplastics. That's how we found. We are almost at, until uh, 20 micron size of microplastics we have been found in our uh, several samples. And uh, so that's that's the things that it is coming uh, through the sewage system, and that's that's how it is very important to understand that how we can re remove the microplastic from the uh, sewage, and that's that's where we have to work in the uh, sewage treatment plant. Next is the primary microplastics. What I told that where we should really work. That I have. That's why I wanted to work on the several primary microplastic sources like cosmetics, these microplastic beads, and also the uh, the the fibers from the washing machine effluent. So in the microplastic beads, we have found like uh, you know like uh, 32 to 40, I think, type of polymers we have found in that polyacetylenes, uh, you know, fluoride, polypropylene. These are the major polymers. With these polymers, we can understand that from uh, these are the major sources of microplastics in our water bodies, in our ecosystems. And these are the microfibers, uh, what we have found from the washing machine effluent. Why it is important to understand that what these washing machine influence are playing a role in our water bodies. Actually, these microfibers are very, very important because I will come next because these microfibers are the major sources which we are finding in the several biota. That's why it is very important to understand the, from where these microfibers are coming. It is We have found the microfibers are coming from this washing machine effluents, but it could be some of the microfibers can be water, uh, waterborne or some of the microfibers can be the airborne also. So that's important to understand uh, based on their uh, polymer type, we can understand the source. So here the overall summarize of the polymers where, uh, which I have uh, found in our studies, uh, we, we have seen that uh, these uh, five polymers like polyacrylamide, this uh, EVOH, and these are the five polymers. The, these are the major sources of the polymers which comes from the several land-based sources which I have shown right now. Next, when we have moved to the biota to understand that where, how much microplastics are having in the biota, we have seen the fin fishes and the shell fishes, and that's uh, uh, that work we have published in uh, uh, two papers. The majorly, what in in brief, what I want to say that we have found a lot of fibers, microplastics in the biota, in the, in the guts of the fin fishes, and but when it comes about the shell fishes, uh, we have to see the whole body of the shell fishes. There, the threat lies. So we have to understand that how much is the concentration, whether this concentration is a, is a threatening level or not. These are the major part of the research work which we need to do. So uh, finally, uh, we have worked some of the part that how these microplastics even can help. Uh, you know, the, the, if we can really understand to a really uh, search finding the you know the solution. That's how I have collected some microplastics uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, checked in our laboratory. Our team has checked and then we found that we there are some bacteria which can be really, really responding in the microbial degradations. That's a very, very preliminary study we have, we have done. Uh, these bacteria and fungi we have got uh, from the microplastic which are lying in the beaches itself. So the bacteria or the fungi or these kind of microbes which already are there, if they can be helpful to for our further mitigation process, that will be a very good research work for our the, uh, future studies. So well, uh, so far the 
microplastic what I, have, I was talking about, which is already there, as I said, in from 21st centuries, we are already there, which is gone to the oceans. But is that all that we have? No, because we are already, again, getting a whole lot of single-use uh, plastics again after the post-COVID. You can see here, we are getting masks, gloves, and several kind of plastics uh, products, which is like single-use which already we have told as a, as a law that single-use plastics are banned. But do we know that what are the single-use plastics? Is that the, only the straws and cutleries and all are defined? There are few which is already not, not yet defined. So that we have to understand that what are the other single-use plastics, whether it, the re-entry is occurring or not, we have to be really very careful. As you can see that this, this kind of plastic, single-use plastic, this, these are lying in the uh, different part of the oceans. And in our lab, we have studied this uh, several type of gloves and, uh, and we have found uh, this particular type of uh, butadiene uh, as a polymer. So this butadiene also we have found as a microplastic, you can see in that, in, the, in this figure. Here also we have found. So, so we can relate, it could be, uh, there could be some sources of uh, this butadiene, it could be from the gloves. We have to check, we have to do a lot of research work on that. Also, these three kinds of polymers have been found from this mask itself. So these are like polyester, polypropylene, and another polypropylene. So these are can this can be again a new source of microplastic which are entering to the oceans. So we have to check on that. We have done a lot of beach cleanups uh, work as a part of CSI NIO, and uh, we, we found a lot of like more than 1,000 kilograms um, over the uh, you know 1.5 kilometer stretch. Beach cleanup, you can get so many plastics. But is that all that we can do? This cleanup work is momentarily can help. But if we really need to work on that uh, major solution and mitigation process, then we have to understand that. Once these plastic fragments are dispersed into the greater environment, they are impossible to recover. So our conclusions that policies and practices that ensure the plastics or the plastic coated pla paper products do not enter the compost system must be input uh, in, into the place if compost operations are to remain an environmentally sound alternative. Because, you know, landfilling or the incinerations are not the solution. You are creating, again, a, a variety of other kind of pollutants to just destroy one pollutants. So you have to find the environmental friendly uh, solution. Of course, there are many reasons we can do that. We can refuse uh, the single-use plastics. We can reuse. We can do a lot of things. but. Several things I want to point out where we can really work. First, refusing this single-use plastic, we can uh, completely uh, switch over to this alternative eco-friendly things, which are really, really, uh, it could be a good industry. It could be really helpful for our society and also for our env environment. Secondly, hazardous chemicals, what we are finding, as I said, the plasticizer, that is palette or bisphenol A or flame retardants, these are already there in these bottles or the plastic related products. So this eventually is this leaching out, which we cannot see. We cannot exactly give you the data, exactly give you the figure, but it is happening. So as we know it is happening, we can really, really avoid this part. We can, first part industry can work. So BPA free plastic bottle can be made or not. Second part, what we can do in our level that we can refuse these plastic bottles. Instead of that, we can use glass bottles or metal bottles. That could be really helpful in our own level. Next, instead of these microplastic beads, we can use a lot of other beads in our cosmetics industry, which cosmetic industry could really work on that. We have several organic products uh, which can be used as an exfoliator, as a, as a cosmetic. So why not? switching over to those things which is like sugars and th there are plenty of organic uh, scrubbers are there which can be replaced uh, and we can replace the micro bits with these organic bits. And there should be some techniques for the removal of these microplastics in wastewater. As I said in our research work, we have got a quite a uh, abundance of microplastic in the wastewater system. So we are really, really, we should really uh, formulate the projects 
which uh, will be like uh, using the biota or the, the sources which is lying in the ocean itself. See, SDG 14 is saying what? SDG 14 is saying the use the, the, the resources and be, beneath the ocean. So we are actually working on that sustainable development goal. So if we are really want to work on that, we have to use the resources which is there in our ocean itself. Just like that, jellyfish can be really, really useful to, to remove this microplastic from the wastewater. Very preliminary studies are there. We can really work on this. Research and industry both should work together to find out the solutions. And second, this microbial degradation of microplastic, which already the research work is are, uh, already going on. But to regulate and tackle this increasing microplastic pollution, we need deeper understanding about this bio-based mitigation approaches. And the engineering technologies also should be required for this microbial degradation process. There's few uh, applications are going on like omics and uh, omics approaches. So basically we need to work a lot on this microbial part we, uh, to understand that how this degradation can, of the microplastic can be done. And uh, this microplastic from textiles also, uh, this is also can be used in the circular economy. Because today we are talking about a lot of talking about uh, this circular economy, how these plastics can be recycled, how this microplastic can be recycled. And again, we can utilize the sources uh, as a circular economy. So when we are talking about this, then I would say this, the wearing and washing of this textile of the synthetic plastic fiber is one of the recognized source of microplastics, as I already told. So why not switching over from the synthetic material to some kind of organic sources, uh, even in the textile industry. So there are a lot of work need to be done in the textile industry, which we can do together. So uh, from, from my side, these are the several things which I have pointed out and where we can work together when we are talking about the microplastic pollution and the sustainable development part. So um, yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahua. Uh, that is uh, enormous work on microplastics. Uh, so uh, it is open for question and answer. Oh, I have one question for you. Now, uh, some uh, plastics which we get in the market, mm. they are called biodegradable plastics. Yeah. Are they really biodegradable? Uh, that's that's what I also wanted to know. I, I brought some products from this market and I have checked in my lab. Uh, these are not polymers, okay? What they are saying, the biodegradable, these are not, at least I can assure that these are not polymers, but how much that is biodegradable that we have to understand along with our organic waste and whether it is bio, actually biodegrading along with our organic waste or not, just like how we are composting our organic waste, these materials can be compostable or biodegradable that need to work, that we haven't checked. But definitely what they are demanding, they, these are not polymers that uh, I have checked for few companies' uh, products. Well, whatever I had read sometimes from them, I came to know that they are brittle. Brittle, and yeah. And they become powder. Like yeah. So people think that they are biodegradable, but this powder and bitterness of it is more dangerous because it becomes microplastic. Yeah, yeah. No, but then uh, that that's what uh, was my aim to understand whether it is plastics or not. Mm -hmm. If it is brittling, also it uh, few products what I checked, it is not plastics. But yes, there are few products which they are demanding bio, uh, biodegradable plastic. These are those are polymers. Those can be uh, the low cost polymer, and that can be brittle. That can cause the microplastics. But other some products, what I checked, these are not polymers. So even if it is that broken up, that will not create the microplastics as per my study. Thank you, Mahua. Microplastics uh, not attracts. Not attracts. These are carries. Yeah. Mm, substrate. Yeah. This is micro carbon thing. Right. This is internally as a perifica. Yep. Spirit of uh, banning microplastic, they're just, they're neutral. Yep. Neutral substrate material. And um, somewhere I say, it's a paint of microplastics. Because microplastics, people use 
Uh, can you just repeat your question, exact question? Sentence. Yeah. State of microplastic. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's what one paper we have published because always this is create a question. Okay, microplastics has been found in the uh, in the uh, biota. But what exactly they are doing? Is that really threatening to the body? And what, what exactly to the uh, it is causing to the biota? What is the fit? So that's what one small study we have done in shrimp. We have uh, feeded the microplastics with their feed, and uh, yeah, very clear uh, uh, change of their enzymatic reactions and uh, their body changes. It has been shown. It, it was a I think 72 hour study and we have found that uh, the changes that also we have published. Yeah. So that means it is actually uh, causing a lot of threats. Yes, in abroad, in uh, globally, there are a few studies which are showing that exactly it is uh, how it is working in the, in the body of a biota, how, what are the, uh, you know, threatening things, uh, hazardous things they are causing in the body. But this research we have to do in our uh, country uh, because it is a it's a huge task to check in several biota we are working on that but we have already checked in one uh, species of shrimp where we have found that uh, the effect of microplastics Yes. We start from the home. Yeah. Yep. One more last question, Dr. Mohua. Yeah. I suppose uh, fish processing units or uh, industry or cosmetic companies, if they want to uh, test their products for presence of microplastic, uh, can they contact CSIR and I would? Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely, we have done uh, uh, some pro pro uh, projects uh, along with our external industries people uh, to check the cosmetics and uh, what are the quantifications and what kind of polymer it is. So uh, those kind of work uh, CSR and IO can do. We have that facilities. Yeah, because that is needed. Like if they want to yeah. uh, sell the fish or they want to export the fish to different countries. Yes. In beforehand, they have to test for microplastics. Yeah, we can yeah. do that. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mova. Thank you. So let us move on to the next speaker, Dr. Samir Damre. He is joining us virtually. Dr. Samir Dhamri is a principal scientist in Biological Oceanography Division of CSIR NIO. He did PhD in Marine Science on Occurrence and Adaptation of Deep Sea Fungi at CSIR NIO. Thereafter, he did postdoctoral research at Institute for Marine Biotechnology, Krebswald in Germany. His research expertise include microbiology and extremophiles, biotechnology, molecular biology, and marine biodiversity. He has been awarded many fellowships and awards. To name few, he received Young Scientist Award in 2010 for Earth, Atmosphere, Ocean and Planetary Science, CSIR. Senior Microbiologist Award in 2019-20 by Microbiologist Society of India. Dr. Samir is a mentor for many PhD students. Three students have been awarded PhDs and six are ongoing. He has 46 publications and three patents to his credit. Dr. Samir is a member of many advisory boards like Executive Council, Vigyan Parishad, Goa, Center of Excellence in Maritime Studies, Mumbai University, Board of Studies for Microbiology Department at Shivaji University, Kolhapur, and many more. With this brief introduction, I would now request Dr. Samir Damre to present his talk on analytical facilities for evaluation of mar marine contaminants. Over to you, Dr. Samir. Yeah, thank you, Supriya. I'm just sharing my slides. Yes. Yeah, the slides are visible and I'm audible. Yes, yes. Okay, good afternoon everybody. So I'll be just touching upon briefly the analytical facilities and capabilities what we have at NIO 
for all the pollution related talks, what we have been hearing from morning today, uh, in this, uh, I connect event when we are talking about the marine environmental safety, uh, and then the testing of the different products. Uh, so, going into like, what is a contaminant, which we need to really worry about? It's either a biological, chemical, physical, or a radiological substance, which becomes harmful for any living organism when accidentally or deliberately introduced to air, water, soil, or food. So, here we are concerned about the marine environments. So, in simple language, if we say something is introduced into the environment that is dirty, unclean, or has harmful effects on the organisms living life there. And what are the cause, what causes this contamination? This typically comes from mainly the anthropogenic activities, which are industrial, agricultural, and commercial activities. For example, uh, chemical or the waste spills or the oil leaks, which we hear upon uh, many a times. I will not go into the details because previous speakers have already touched upon this. So these are the different sources of pollutions. Uh, what we saw in the, the industries or the uh, Potential just now, Dr. Mova spoke about the uh, cosmetics for the microplastics. Uh, then the agricultural waste also, wherein you have a lot of fertilizers as runoffs which go. Then hospitals, the households, the wastewater treatment plants are trying their best, but then unfortunately, the, the full capacity is really not possible with the amount of waste we are generating. And ultimately, it contaminates either the surface water, groundwater, and which leads into the uh, the rivers and the uh, Oceans. So, what are the major pollutants in this marine environment? We have been hearing from the previous speakers oil, sewage, pesticides, toxic chemicals, heavy metals, radioactive waste. Okay, not in many places, but selective places where they have uh, uh, this uh, waste generation potential, thermal pollution, and then the nutrients, like I said, from the fertilizers and all. Although they are nutrients, but ultimately they are added into the natural body. So, they are the Pollutants which are causing anything over and above the values which are there is anything uh, excess is a pollutant. Before going to the measurements, let us see this uh, small cartoon depicting how long until it's gone. We are hearing a lot about the plastic contamination. A simple plastic bag which we use, the single time plastic, will be remaining for at least 10 to 20 years. A cardboard box for two months, it gets degraded fast because of some of the Fungi, which are because it's of the cellulosic nature, the cigarette butt, which is being thrown uh, irresponsibly into the places one to five years. The fishing line, which many people lose, wool socks, glass bottles. There is no study where they can really uh, determine how long it will stay. Paper towel, two to four weeks, aluminum cans, the list can go on and on. But then there are some of them like the styrofoam, which now government is trying to control the styrofoam and single use plastics. These are really ones which are polluting. And then we heard the previous speaker talking about the microplastics. They are the sources where with the microscopic, uh, the microplastics come through. So with all these pollutants, it is extremely important to quantify the level of contamination. If you need to work upon its mitigation, we need to know what are the levels and how much is the contamination. So it could be done through simple observations, uh, like just counting, like say, the plastic bottles and other stuff, you can just count or you can pick up and uh, say uh, this many kgs or this many bottles we found. Or the second more analytical approach is the modern sophisticated equipments, which I'm going to, some of them I'm going to uh, introduce in my talk today. Uh, talking to the biological contamination, we can do, um, this I'm talking with regards to what we are doing at NIO and what could be done in general also. So the first and foremost are the conventional microbiological techniques that is in that involves the plating the, for the looking into the bacterial loads. Uh, then the microscopy that involves the bacteria as well as other planktonic forms and uh, more the modern tools like flow cytometry, where you get the counts much more easier than the conventional techniques which are there. Uh, then we move on from the organism level to the uh, molecular uh, level of the organisms or the atomic level of the uh, chemicals. So these are one of the most majorly used uh, instruments, gas chromatograph or gas chromatograph, the uh, mass spectrometer, that's what is called as a GCMS. 
So these are very, very important in any of the environmental toxicity testing laboratory or even the pharma industries, which is very important. So this is basically you can use for any of the chemical or the component which can be converted to a gaseous state. And ultimately this gaseous state is, uh, there is a column inside, which is a solid, uh, and then you have the gaseous phase passing into, and ultimately that is separated into the different constituents. And then you can uh, have your standards running into uh, and separate the components of the mixture and you can identify uh, to whichever level your instrument is capable of uh, separating out the instruments. And then GC is basically used as a primary one to just separate the components in the mixture. Whereas GCMS is a high end machine where you can use the exact molecular weight calculation. So if you want to just uh, quantify uh, the uh, major components you can for the known components you can use always a GC and if you need to really look into the unknown compound you need to identify and you need to calculate the exact molecular weights that is where GCMS comes into picture. So these are all the facilities which we have in our institute. Uh, I'm having yeah. Okay, so based on this uh, GC and GCMS in our introductory uh, talk by Professor Sunil Kumar Singh, he also talked about this tar balls, which is a real menace in on the Goan beaches. So uh, we have a crude oil fingerprinting laboratory in our institute, which was started uh, some seven to eight years back. Uh, so a couple of scientists are working. Dr. Sunil Vasimala is looking after this laboratory, wherein uh, they are looking into the sources of this pollution from exactly where. And this was a wonderful paper which came out in 2013, where they identified the sources of tar balls deposited along the Goa coast using this fingerprinting techniques. So here uh, GCIRMS is used, which is further more sophisticated, GCMS and GCIRMS. So each uh, the crude oils which are used in the world, they have each a unique signature, which is called as a fingerprint, which is like this. You get some of these uh, peaks here, which are like called a spectra, and this has So based on this, you can identify the source of the your pollution from where it is coming in. So this process is called as a, a crude oil fingerprinting. The then we have a good number of IRMS in our institute. We have five numbers. Dr. Samir, we are not able to hear you. Samir, Samir can you please... One minute. Uh. One minute. Uh. Which slide it was? 
one minute huh? it says already it says i have already in the meeting one minute huh? okay yeah one minute one minute can you see now Yeah, yeah. Okay. I should put that. No, I, I, it is saying you're already sharing. Okay, I'll just unshare and I'll share once again. Yes, okay. Okay, one minute. See now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there was some problem in the internet. Uh, we were talking about the uh, the mass spectrometers. So these are one of the most uh, advanced analytical uh, equipments which are available for very, very broad applications. Uh, they are being used in forensic sciences, uh, food industries, uh, in the pharma industries, archaeology, geochemistry, biological sciences, anywhere you really need to identify the elemental structure, the uh, composition, you can use these machines. Apart from that, we have couple of specialized IRMSs, uh, the uh, uh, HRICP, that is high resolution and the MCICP, that is multi-collector. So these are mostly used for the elemental analysis and mainly for the metals and the dress metals, which could be uh, quantified at PPB levels also. So apart from that, we also have in our institute XRD, XRF, that is X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescence, and uh, which are used for all the elemental analysis in all kinds of samples and uh, scanning electron microscope for the microscopic observations of the samples, biological as well as the geological material. Uh, so all these uh, instruments at present, uh, CSIR has come out with a common platform, which is called as an analytical CSIR. So all these major analytical instruments from different, not only NIO, from other CSIR laboratories also are available at one website. So I can uh, tell, I mean, it's, uh, you all can uh, explore this site, it's www.analyticalcsir.in where you need to register and you can book your test online and then you can send a sample uh, depending on the conditions which are there for analysis each in each machine uh, they have different like some machines you can send across the samples some you need to come with the samples so you can go and contact the uh, respective uh, in here uh, at present we have dr pramod maurya he is coordinating this analytical csr website so before i go into thank you i would like to just go ahead like it's the people who make the biggest difference are like how Mova said, we should start from home. The people who make the biggest difference are the ones who do not uh, little things, who do the little things consistently. Like one bamboo to toothbrush equal, is equal to four plastic, glass floss, reusable water bottle, reusable bag, which is a simple thing is equal to around 170 to 200 plastic bags. So if each one of us look into all this, then we won't have this litter problem and uh, analysis and then document the pollution. This I would like to end my talk. Thank you. Thank you. So let us go to the next talk. So next we have Mr. N. Vinay Kumar, Technical Director, Adachi Swipe Green Private Limited, Bangalore. His title of talk is Advanced Wastewater Treatment Technology. Mr. N. Vinay Kumar is a graduate in fishery science and postgraduate in fishery biochemistry. He has 10 years of experience in shrimp hatchery and 15 years of experience in commercial laundry and wastewater treatment. 
He is currently serving as the technical director of Adachi Swipe Green Private Limited, which is involved in the recycling of metal waste and scrap from rejected aluminium utensils, containers, and other used metallic items, etc. <coughs> Am I audible? Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Supriya Silvi, for uh, introduction. I'm uh, representing a company called as Attachee Swipe Green Private Limited, having a brand name called uh, Tigreen. So this uh, Tigreen is a technology for uh, treating wastewater and uh, water treatment uh, process. And then uh, here uh, we are proudly proud to be associated with iConnect, organized by NAO CSR Goa. So I have just a brief presentation on the Tigrin technology. So Tigrin, this company is originating from Bangalore. So this is a portable industrial and domestic wastewater treatment plant using a radical bubble purification technology. This is a patented technology meaning uh, advanced wet oxidation in the process. So this uh, is a disruptive technology. This is a portable plant and it saves uh, real estate by about 90%. And then it can treat water from uh, various waste uh, water sources, be it uh, trade effluents from industries or domestic effluents, sewage or river water. It can be plug and play system. And uh, there is a saving of about 60% of capex as well as in the opex. Here we are generating micro bubble, which is of uh, consistent quality. And the most uh, advantageous system of Tigreen is we don't require any air flow or an air compressor system as compared to the conventional system. Since there is no air blower, we do not have that uh, noise, and then it saves on the maintenance cost as well. It has uh, reduced the uh, plant, uh, plant footprint, which is I uh, require less than uh, one tenth of the required space as compared to the conventional system. Uh, since there is no blower, the connected load is less, and then uh, there is substantial reduction in the process time to treat the wastewater because this is an online process. In conventional system, in most of the systems, it is a batch process where it takes about minimum of four hours to treat a single batch. There is a substantial reduction in the treatment chemical costs and the reduction of TSS, color, COD, POD, nitrates, ammonia, heavy metals, microfibers, and related parameters is expected to be above 70 to 80%. In fact, we have demonstrated close to about 90% also. And this system requires lesser manpower. This can be used as a effluent treatment system for industries and uh, for uh, treating uh, domestic sewage. And then uh, post uh, treatment, it can be left to the underground drainage systems as per the pollution control norms. Or the most important thing is today people are talking about zero waste discharge, zero liquid discharge, settle these systems. So we have to look at systems which we can uh, recycle the wastewater and reuse for allied activities like cooling tower or toilet flush or floor, floor cleaning or gardening. Of course, with the multiple uh, multi-stage filtration system, which is at added end of the line of this tagging system, this water can be rendered portable as well. We can use this system to for detoxification or purification of lakes, ponds, rivers, brackish and marine ecosystems. 
and this has a wide application because we are generating radical bubbles which are uh, less than uh, 5 micron in size so we can uh, do the decomposition of suspended solids detoxification of uh, contaminated uh, soils and it can be used in fermentation process and uh, to improve the soil improvement can be done we can remove the odors and oil and grease and uh, we can separate out the oil and grease from the uh, liquid systems it can be used for purification of uh, fresh water and uh, marine ecosystems then it can be used for pre treatment for desalination of water where we need to reduce the total dissolved solids in the sea water which is coming into the system and then this uh, system has been proved to even uh, accumulate the or reduce the water body which is contaminated with radioactive uh, material and it has a wide application so normally this is used uh, used through a system called as dissolved air flotation technology which is an already established technology in wastewater treatment so there they were using uh, a compressor so here in this same system we have advocated the tigerin system which is uh, producing micro bubbles so we are producing a high concentration of uh, micro bubbles into the left tank wherein uh, this there is a high pressure pump to generate this particular uh, micro bubble and then because of the high pressure we can levitate the whatever the flocculated uh, impurities which are there in the waste water and this will levitated onto the surface of the water and there it is skimmed out this is just a kind of uh, bubbles what we create in the normal uh, lower system the bubble size is bigger and then here it's a micro bubble it's you can see it's like milk so then the retention time the time from for the bubble to go to the surface and uh, burst out it takes a long time because of the bubble size and then there is an increased uh, surface active uh, reaction in the bubble because of the time and the bubble size and then here we are uh, generating a high concentration of uh, oxygen uh, bubbles along with hydroxyl radicals so we are using a multi stage pump with the uh, air suction from the atmosphere and then we are creating the micro bubbles which is pumped into the dissolved air flotation tank to get rid of the impurities this technology was uh, invented by mr adachi from japan who is a patent holder and is a part of our board in tigray so we can use uh, biological or chemical uh, decompositions then using uh, radical bubble technology and uh, dissolved air flotation we can get a high quality water which is rid of bod cod tss nitrates ammonia and the microfibers and oil and grease so these are some of the agents which can be tackled these contaminants can be removed in the, with uh, tigerin technology so it ranges from surfactant agents to the microfiber so since my previous uh, speakers and scientists have been speaking on microfiber just a small uh, recap is the maximum microfiber is contributed to the ocean from clothing and textile industries by about 35% and then you have the city dust also coming in at about 24% and the interesting thing is you have a contamination by the tire industries which is about 28% and then the other contaminants which are less than 10% is uh, beauty products 2% micro marine coatings 3.7% and road parkings 7% and we all know how the microfiber gets into the aquatic systems and can goes back into the human system or the other living organisms which uh, the man feeds on for his greed so this is a tigerin technology where the 
we have tested with uh, water sample from uh, water jet loom. Uh, this water was containing a lot of uh, oil and grease and then a lot of microfibers. And this has been levitated with uh, dye technology, which you can see at the surface of this particular tank. And this is the end result what we get. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to reduce or avoid the microplastics or the, any pollutant which comes from the industries or the domestic uh, treatment plants getting into the aquatic systems which in turn gets into the marine ecosystems. So these are some of the tests what we have done with uh, electroplating uh, wastewaters, sea waters, then lake water, then for commercial laundry, then a vehicle service center, and then the wastewater from resulting from textile dyeing units. And this is uh, from a washing of a colored and oil towel. You can see the pink color, which is coming from the towels and which contains oil. This is actually used in uh, Ayurvedic uh, treatment facility. And on the right hand side, we have this algal removal from the aquatic systems using tigrain. And this is the wastewater from a fermentation industry where we could uh, remove the, the pollutants which is coming from that uh, industry. And this is from a STP plant. And this is interestingly from uh, a KMF, Nandini Milk Dairy, where uh, you get a lot of uh, milk uh, waste products, be it uh, proteins or oils. And those uh, milk related uh, wastewater systems. And of course, these waters are very highly acidic in nature. So we can convert the using uh, green technology. So wastewater treatment, we can convert the class of water. Today, most of the water bodies, what we see is under the classification of E as per the CPCB norms, which can be converted into, which can increase the level, class of the water to the drinking level. So this is a semantic uh, diagram where uh, we are using the tag ring where uh, we use a bar screen for physical filtration. There's an equalization tank and the flocculation tubes where uh, we are injecting uh, chemicals to create flocks. And then we have the tag ring RBP generator, radical bubble generating unit, which is pumped into the flotation tank where the pollutants are levitated onto the system and the skimmer throws it out of the system. And there is a sludge handling system to handle the sludge. And then with the requirement of the treated water, for what reason the water treated water has to be used, we can use end of the line filters like uh, sand filters, activated charcoal filters, softeners, chlorination, and then end of the line filters with the multi-stage systems, including RO, to make it portable. So these are some of the pictures of the installation. So we have installed one in uh, laundry in uh, Bangalore, where we are recycling the water and recovering close to about 90% of the water. And uh, this water is used back into the process to wash their white linen. And this is uh, another installation which is used in uh, oil tank uh, wastewater industry in uh, Malaysia Petronas. Uh, these are some of the pictures of our uh, Bangalore installation. So here you can see the sludge which is skimmed out. The levitation of the pollutants is there happening here and then it is skimmed out. And then uh, the most interesting thing is a 40 kiloliter, uh, kilo, kiloliter per day capacity occupies only about uh, 50 square feet. As against, if you want a conventional system, it requires more than 1,000 to 2,000 square feet of uh, real estate. And we have ready-made models from 1 KLD to 25 KLD. So these are just a few comparisons between the 
Tigering system and the conventional system. As uh, most of you would be aware that the conventional system would be something like this, where you have a lot of tanks, which is occupying a lot of real estate. So as I was stressing that uh, blower is not a must here, the power consumption is less. And this unit is uh, modular and it can be shifted by, from any place to any place. Uh, since the mechanical parts are lesser, you have less uh, maintenance costs because we are generating high oxygen levels concentrations. The sludge generation also is much uh, lesser. And of course, with all said and done, the uh, installation is very quick because it is a plug and play system. And then there's a lot of production in CapEx and OPEX. So now today industries are being stressed by uh, one is the source water. And of course you have all the government bodies which is stressing on the industries to treat their water. So this is the biggest challenge for the industry. We need to advocate to industries which is a viable solution which is economical and which is doable for the industry to treat their wastewater. Because most of the industries which have already been set up, they would have not factored in a wastewater system. So the best way is we have to reduce the consumption of uh, any water. And then we need to get into the recycle mode. Segregation is the key. Then we need to do appropriate treatments depending on the source of the wastewater and then dispose. And the last thing, the worst thing is to incinerate. So we already know that our groundwaters are depleting across the country because uh, most of the industries are uh, largely dependent on uh, groundwater. And today, even agriculture systems are dependent on uh, groundwater systems, especially the freshwater side. So, in just, we would like to associate with uh, NIO, with the appropriate scientists who are already working on uh, microfibers, oil, grease, any pollutants. We would like to see how to incorporate uh, tigering technology to treat uh, the wastewater at the source. When we treat the wastewater at the source, there is a much, much uh, purer uh, aquatic environments, be it uh, lakes or ponds or rivers or brackish or marine ecosystem. So with this opportunity, which is given by NIO, I would like to thank the team of NIO and especially Mr. Dr. Sripada for giving me an opportunity to present this uh, technology which can be, which has practical applications for various industries. Thank you, one and all. If any questions, please, I would be very happy to answer that. Thank you, Mark. Yes, Dr. Shiva. You're not audible. Yeah, someday. Why not? <laughs> uh, see, Dr. Mohua is okay. working on microplastic and here uh, into washing industry at the industrial yes. scale. Please take her help and uh, because definitely are discharging a lot of uh, microfibers. And uh, please take her help to minimize it. Second one, uh, uh, definitely through micro bubbles, um, um, the water can be treated, but instead of you calling wastewater, can we use the word uh, used water just for our convenient? Yeah, yeah, yeah. man is waste. No, no, no resources waste in the See, world. See, all these things are being created because of the greed of the man. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, very, so very. We cannot avoid the greed of the man, so we have to give solutions. And anyway, you said it's cost effective. That's what. Uh, very important. There are many solutions which are not cost effective. And you yes. said it is cost effective, reduced by 60%. And yes. definitely the, the team of scientists are doing extremely well. And you can take a lot of message from NIO. 
and uh, you can also do better service to the society thank you all the best Thank you. We'll, we'll be glad to. Uh, already, uh, sorry, Vinay, I'm Sripad. Already, uh, already, Prakash, uh, the, the Prakash uh, messaged me that uh, so you would like to collaborate with uh, Dr. Dr. Mawasa to see the things, uh, to to study the microplastics. Okay. Mawa, they are interested. Mawa, their their company is interested to take to, to collaborate with you. If it can come happen, this is the best outcome. We can expect one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you one all. Thank you, sir, for giving in detail about different technologies available with you for wastewater treatment. So, are these technologies only available in Bangalore, or there are different units in different places? No, this is a star startup unit. So we have the proof of concept which has been developed in Bangalore, which is running from past. Uh, Four and a half years. So now we are already uh, spread this technology in the Surat industry where there's a lot of textile uh, industries. So we have done a lot of tests in that. And of course, uh, we are in the pipeline of deployment of uh, many such units across the country. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So let us move on to the next speaker. Mr. Avik Seel is the director of Environ Policy Research in India Private Limited, Thane. Title of his talk is Industry's Requirement for Safeguarding Coastal Marine Environment. He has done his graduation in bi biotechnology, post-graduation in genetics, and MPhil in biotechnology. He has vast experience in the field of environment and sustainability over a period of 16 years. He started his career in National Environmental Engineering Research Institute, that is CSIR NIRI. Later, he started an organization called Enviro Policy Research India Private Limited and leading a team of about 18 people for carrying out work related to environmental clearance, high rise clearance, traffic impact assessment, shadow analysis, wind analysis, STP design, solid waste management strategies, disaster management strategies, and many more. He have also carried out many policy analysis and making guidelines for MMRDA, MPCB, MOEF level. His focus is to create opportunity towards scientific research and development, leading to more impactful urban design feature for India. So Mr. Avik is available uh, with us online. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. So, what do you, sir? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, can you can you see my screen? I. Yes, yes. Yeah. I really thank you, ma'am, Supriya, ma'am, as well as Sripada, sir, for giving me this opportunity, as well as NIO to uh, bring uh, everything in this uh, yeah. one platform. So, yeah. basic role I was no, given no, no. for this. Uh, given for this uh, talk was to you know the role of industries or what we as an industry is looking for. So this is the basic uh, thing that was I'm going to talk about what is industries are looking and what uh, 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 we as a consultant also looking at how to bridge the gap between the scientist scientific research to the industries. So to begin with, I am I focusing on two aspects. Basically, I work uh, uh, on uh, EIAs as well as policies. The two important aspects of marine pollution we are talking about. One is plastic. We all know that this is really creating a havoc. Uh, India is ranked around 12th among the most polluted country in the uh, world with respect to creating this pollution into the oceans. Amount of uh, plastic which has gone into uh, uh, our first speaker spoke about the direct serve. So this is known to everyone. Uh, second aspect is the oil spillage. The oil spillage things really took off when the uh, few oil spillage happened in Mumbai, and then everybody came to the uh, uh, consequence that this is a very big thing. There is economical damage. There is uh, other damages which is taking place. Now. I can tell you that okay, most of the drilling fluids which are used, most whatever you are using in uh, in terms of uh, activities, about 50% is going as a part of the waste. So that is a huge quantity. 
Now, if we see some of the chart uh, of this is uh, something we took from BBC, uh, the number of spillage is it is decreasing, but the quantity of oil is increasing. So this is another something which we need to think about. Okay, that is decreased, but the quantity is increasing. So we are not achieving anything out of it. Now, many things, mainly the industries are driven, industries are all driven by guidelines. They will look for what are the norms, rules, regulations, and they talk up, uh, work on it. In India, MOF in 2005, this is a toxicity level guideline, which has been set up, which talks about concentration of about 30,000 mg per liter, and uh, in the barite, what kind of heavy metals is to be present. But in our guideline, we're not talking about anything about biodegradable assessment or assessment with, uh, with respect to soil and sediments. Those are mainly been talked about by OECD and US EPA. So uh, as Sipata uh, presented in the earlier, so all this biodegradability assessment and all are, in, uh, are all as per the US EPA standard. Now, why biodegradability is important? See, if a oil or a drilling fluids or anything gets into the uh, sea, if if it is not persistent, if it is gets easily biodegraded, impact will be lesser. If it is not, the impact will be more. So those aspects and those where we, we need to also look into our policy development as well. What are the gaps? Currently we have, we have all developed environment management plan, but we're not carrying out proper audits of those environment management. Sampling happening, okay, with respect to air and water. There are a lot of uh, uh, untreated water which is getting discharged into our oceans. Uh, testing is happening when some company wants to get it tested, when I'm bringing some material to India, that time only those testing happens. It is not happening on a voluntary basis or, a, or not happening on a uh, regulatory basis. They just want, if I'm bringing in some chemicals, I got to get it tested. In our testing, more focus should be given on biodegradability. As I said, yes, it is easy. Uh, if a component gets easily biodegraded, it is useful. And there are a lot of baseline data and reports, okay, which are present, but that interpretation of them are still missing in our in our in our in our system. So, so what are uh, are we looking at? You know? So there should be there should be quick mechanism, you know, to safeguarding our industries, research and its implementation. You know that is uh, that is uh, an important aspects. We need to look into solution based approach. We need to look for clean technologies. Now, a lot of technologies we are developing, even when I used to work in NIRI, we used to develop a lot of technologies um, um, in laboratory scale. But when going to the field, we, we face a lot of different challenges, which was not there in our laboratories. So those challenges to the from the laboratory to the field, the research has to go in now that direction. Field implementation and how to um, uh, get the solution at the field itself. We need to upgrade our policies. We have a policies which have been determined or that gonna drive, uh, drive the business foods. And implement, we should have all the policies towards creating a system. Policies should not be created or rules or regulations should not be framed that, uh, that will uh, restrict the businesses. Because now on the other side of the table, I can talk about, yes, the business has to come with safeguarding the environment. Now, what the role mainly the industries plays? Number one is the business. They are really helping in the GDP. We cannot uh, say okay, we are not uh, industry are not doing that. They are. Now, industries also need betterment of the policies with respect to environment assessment and safeguarding that environment. Many industries have CSR activities, but they want to convert it into environment management. Implementable EMPs needs to be developed and the EMPs, the environment management plan needs to be audited. We are all preparing EMPs even for EIA reports, but when they're getting implemented, whether really getting implemented or not, we don't know. Okay, so that is where that is where industries needs to come forward and develop the EMPs which are really implementable. Technologies, yes, most of the industries are going for better technologies and betterment of it. So well, the rules we are affecting, this is uh, uh, the mandate of NIO. The NIO's mandate, it talks about uh, doing all the uh, very good thing, and they're doing very good things. But NIO is restricting themselves to 
can we think of whatever the rivers, ponds, lakes? The rivers are getting connected to the, my ocean. So if I if I take care of this, it could be a benefit. So that is where we need to go into the niche. I can add on to this into uh, like uh, our nalas, open nalas. What will happen to them? So can we think of going to much lower level, uh, grassroot level, and developing our technologies and getting the technologies implemented? So what are the win-win situations? So this was the basic idea to develop. NIO definitely have a lot of baseline studies, technologies, expert opinions. NIO has the experts. So the EI reports vetting and developing EI reports into much more robust. Uh, marine ecology and uh, uh, GIA-based mapping. So all these NIOs has. So those has to get into with the industrial mode. Industries has market demand. Uh, we have a lot of sophisticated analysis, which we, we require, and we, we, we also carry out a lot of modeling studies. Okay, so all these studies we are doing, and this approach needs to come together in a win-win situation, which will lead to betterment of our EIA reporting. EIA reports currently have been prepared, but they are not been taken as a decision-making tools. Our EIA system has to become a decision-making tools. Okay, if there is a problem, how a solution is being developed, and what are the solutions? So that is where our EIA reporting and needs to uh, uh, get into. This will also aid in a lot of technology transfer. NIO has a lot of technologies, but transfer them. Then uh, there will be a lot of things from the industry level, the challenges which we faced. So that's how the uh, solution-based approach needs to be created. That's how a knowledge sharing model, this is kind of needs to be developed with the industries and along with the consultant, we can play the uh, 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 dissipating this knowledge. So that is something uh, uh, I was uh, like, what is the way ahead? We all know okay, there is uh, sustainability goals. These are all been now been uh, uh, channelized. Now sustainability is getting converted to ESG goals, but mainly those are for industry. Those are like my, uh, I can say those are like my marketing strategies. Now, can I can I can I think of converting them into climate change models? What are the climate change models that we can develop with 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 sustainability and ESG goals? Also, how industries plays the role also in ocean management because many industries are taking that because that is the cheapest route. So industries are using it. So their ESG goals should come into this and how we develop a solution based approach with all the newer technology pollution controls and then develop an integrated policy for different industry we should have different policies towards safeguarding the uh, uh, the uh, environment as well as leading to sustainable growth and development so that was the small things that uh, we wanted to highlight you what is the industry is looking for industry is definitely looking for support industry is definitely looking for better technologies Clean technologies, yes, industries are looking for, which NIO already is having. Now there needs to be a collaborative effect and the all parties to come together and develop into a holistic approach. And we need to develop a proper vision map, okay, which will <coughs> aid in doing this. Okay, I thank you everyone. This is a very small uh, presentation I wanted to highlight. Okay, so I thank all of you for patients hearing and I thank the entire team of NIO for uh, having me over here today. Thank you, Mr. Avixil. Uh, you have uh, elaborated on different EMPs and EIA, EIA studies and how NIO can uh, uh, take forward this work, not only in the marine, but to the lakes or to the ponds. So we are noting down this point and uh, we will discuss this uh, point in our discussion, panel discussion. So please be online. Well, first, Sorry, thank you very much. Uh, I also agree with you, not only toxicity, echo, acute toxicity, we also had to do the biodegradability test along with the uh, acute toxicity all the time. Yeah, I agree with this. This I think I remember you have been consistently telling this. I think it, it also came in your some of other papers as well. Uh, yes. Good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we are doing uh, the study when I was in Navy also. 
yeah, uh, you know, that biodegradability studies, there are only, you know, the, uh, uh, the American companies, they were asking to do this because they wanted from Indian Ocean go to Pacific Ocean and all. So that is how the things were, you know, for them, the biodegradability was much more important rather than toxicity. You know, so that is where our Indian goals also should, you know, uh, go into. Yes, Vinay, sir. Yes, see, you are talking about uh, policies. Uh, I would like to just introduce one thing. I mean, uh, so for the existing industries who convert uh, or who go for a wastewater treatment plant or something like that, they have to be incentivized. Today, what Pollution Control Board does is they only uh, catch them and then penalize them. Or the first uh, word which comes from the Pollution Control Board is a closure notice or the show card notice. Focus These are notice, only two yes. words they know. So we have to promote the industries and we have to attract them to educate them and go towards the wastewater treatment and any way, whether it is liquid waste or air waste. Air waste handling or solid waste. They need to be incentivized. This has to go into the policies which will attract many industrialists to get into it. Yeah. So to come on this, uh, there are two things, you know, uh, like like how in Mumbai, uh, what what uh, way, if you have an STP in place, okay, and it is functioning, you know, their main thing is it's functioning. Okay. So there you'll get property tax rebate. So that is been now came in, you know, in Mumbai, Pune, in Thane, you know, our this jurisdiction of this. So they have this. So that is, you know, kind of lucrative. Now on the other side, challenge what the societies and all are facing is they're not getting trained manpower to run those STPs. So that is another challenge. Now going to going to industry side, I did few of the audits, okay, uh, of, of high-end companies. So what we highlighted okay, through your uh, industrial wastewater, how much water you can save and indirectly what could be the saving in terms of your cost with buying the water because all the industries are buying water from MIDC and all. So indirect way, what could be the benefit? And when we did the audit with uh, uh, our um, uh, this Deepak fertilizer there, we came to from one process to the next process, you can use the same water. You do not need to have a fresh water coming in, you know, so internal water lining, because they have around 11 to 14 different uh, processes internally functioning. Okay, so each process needed at this quantity of water or, or this quality of water, which a process treatment was giving them. So that way, you know, holistic approach, I, I, I totally understand. Yes, incentives is one case, but as a part of EIA report, uh, uh, this, uh, STP, ETP are compulsion also, okay, maintaining and yes, all the decision, I, I agree with you, all the decision ultimately goes on, on the money factor. You know, if I can show them that, yes, this is the carrot, they will agree. You know, so ultimately everything will go on that, okay? Thank you. So things are changing, you know, sir, things are changing. Yes, when I started in uh, that time, nobody used to talk about uh, ETP, kya hai, kya nahi, and everything was used to get it, get it through, you know, now the things are not happening in that fashion, you know, so things are changing and it will happen. Incentives will come in, I feel, you know, slowly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Avik Seel. I thank you all the thank speakers you, um, who participated in this event. Definitely our scientists at NIO and the, in the audience, uh, it has added a lot of knowledge and we will see how holistically we will work together. So next we will uh, move on to the panel discussion. So we have with us uh, Dr. Mandar uh, Najakar, Principal Scientist, CSIR NIO, Dr. Shiv Kumar Magda, Dean, College of Fisheries, Mangalore, Dr. Durbar Ray, Principal Scientist, NIO, Dr. Rishikesh Pawar, Scientist, from Fisheries, KVK South Goa, Department of Agriculture, Goa. Dr. Narsiha Thakur, Senior Principal Scientist, CSIR NIO. We also have Dr. Mohua Saha, uh, Principal Scientist. So let us begin. So to start with, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Mandar. So uh, you have been doing a lot of EIA studies. 
from the past. As we understand that EI studies play a critical uh, role for environmental decision making process in India. So Dr. Mandar, can, can you please enlighten on how, what kind of challenges are associated with this study, whether the locals are aware of EIA studies happening in NIO? Uh, audible? Okay, uh, yeah, this is, I think, uh, audible, probably. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to be part of this iConnect program. Uh, and uh, much uh, relevant question what you have asked uh, to what Mr. Uh, Avik Sil uh, was talking about right now, about uh, uh, impact assessment studies as well and how they can be best utilized uh, uh, as far as uh, NIO is concerned, yeah, NIO is doing a lot of coastal EIs. And uh, basically, if you see, uh, EI remains a very robust process. Uh, it has a quite a good, uh, strong regulatory framework. Uh, uh, but the issue what happens is uh, it is specifically uh, related to or uh, focused on a project, a project area which is uh, quite a small area considering the marine realm as such. So if we see marine ecosystems or coastal ecosystems as well, uh, it encompasses quite a large area. And EIs uh, remain quite specific to say a single port or a industry or a jetty or uh, any other developmental project. So uh, that is one part uh, where uh, I mean, how it can be utilized for, say, policy uh, formulation, uh, it becomes difficult because it is very industry specific and site specific. While marine areas, they're quite, quite large. And uh, once uh, the pollutants get dissipated and once the hydrodynamics comes in question, uh, all the equations change and it's just beyond the project scope. Uh, so that is one part. So. Uh, to overcome that, uh, I think uh, there's uh, a new type of study which are uh, which uh, have been done in India. Uh, they are called uh, carrying capacity studies. So it uh, almost takes the entire region into consideration, all the industries into uh, consideration, and then uh, uh, what the landscape level impacts are there. So uh, those kind of studies might help uh, as tool in decision making. And and there is one more uh, another new aspect which is coming up. Uh, it's also implemented by uh, MOEF uh, recently. It's called marine spatial planning. So using this data set and the overlapping land uses, not actually to call land uses, they should be sea uses. So uh, based on that, how how best we can uh, manage the seas. So that is one part. And uh, social, you had asked about uh, society and uh, local stakeholders as well. I think uh, they are um, uh, very important part of EI. They uh, come up into uh, r and policy as well. So there is a robust policy. So they have to be taken on board but because many of the projects get stalled because of that. So r and policy talks about a lot many aspects to be taken care of uh, about the local people. So that is an integral part of EI. So that's what I would like to suggest uh, that uh, encompassing all the parameters, it's uh, um, the EI becomes a robust document, but again, the implementation part, it becomes really difficult. So that is one of the biggest challenges as far as uh, implementation and monitoring of uh, these uh, processes uh, is concerned. So, uh, thanks. Uh, and I think uh, Mr. N. Vinay Kumar has some question. No, no, no. Okay, let us yep. proceed. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mova, 
you have been working on uh, different microplastics from uh, um, fish biota as well as from uh, different cosmetics so mm. what kind of different tests we can do at csir and io mm. so that it will help uh, industries or uh, cosmetic companies or whether like when they are using this in the cosmetic whether it is harmful because we are applying it topically whether it is harmful for our skin mm. So can you please elaborate on this? Yeah, actually, first of all, uh, we have to understand how many, how, if I'm talking about just a small part of this cosmetic industry, okay? So if we, uh, there are a lot of microbits. Now, first of all, when we are checking it, that in 50 ml of a tube, how much microbits are there? And that means how much microbits can contribute from one particular product. So there are definitely a scope to completely reduce or replace so that we can help to the cosmetic industry to uh, say that what kind of polymer they are using they know that what kind of polymer they are using but is that really uh, feasible for the uh, environment or is, is that environment friendly that we can definitely guide them that kind of consultancy we can do with the industry definitely uh, similarly with the textile industry that how much synthetic micro microfibers are coming from each kind of textiles and whether that see fast few wash only these microfibers are coming and that time only the huge amount of microfiber fibers are coming to the uh, environment so that uh, can be replaced and how much is the microfibers are coming from the each wash or uh, that textile industry we can help uh, so that sort of several things in terms of the abundance, whether we can do the quantification and after quantification, we can say whether there is a scope to reduce and that they can do. Number two, we can say that replacement can be done or not, whether that polymer is actually environmental friendly, it is good for the biota or not, that also we can say. So several aspects definitely we can say to the industry, we can help them out. Yes, thank you, Dr. Mohua. So let us move to uh, Dr. Magda. So, uh, sir, you in the morning session you explain a lot of fishery technologies. So, uh, before uh, starting these technologies in the coastal water or op uh, open ocean water, so do you need any help from CSIR and IO? Like, how to do the, what kind of tests are required? So, before starting this in the seas. Uh, in fact, enough knowledge base is already known. So the issue is in implementing enforcement and uh, monitoring that's all. All uh, laid down procedures are there. The officers or competent authorities must see to it that they follow the given guidelines. And in fact, I've asked all the questions then and there itself. You can escape the responsibilities, but you cannot escape the consequences for escaping the responsibilities. Let us be responsible and accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Magda. So I would like to know from Dr. Thakur that what kind of instrumentation facilities do we have at uh, NIO which will help uh, these industries or uh, the stakeholders? Yes, well, um, Supriya, uh, NIO's business development group is very strong and uh, we are providing consultancy services to various industries and also sponsor projects we handle in a year. And previous speakers have already highlighted that we have a centralized analytical facility and all the de details of this facility, uh, Dr. Samir Damre was showing it's available on CSR websites. So uh, those analytical tools or the uh, uh, equipments we are having so we can provide those things. Then as far as the present, uh, the ta uh, topic of this particular meeting is concerned, uh, that we can do uh, water quality monitoring in the lab various toxicity uh, studies then uh, as dr mao was mentioning microplastic studies that is a new thing we are uh, we can add in our uh, portfolio so these are uh, the test or analytical testings we can provide uh, from nio earlier uh, in bioorganic chemistry lab we used to provide uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies used to come to us and we have 
uh, NMR, uh, LCMS, and IR, that kind of facility. So those equipments also can be used for this purpose. So, uh, uh, and I was well equipped as far as analytical facility is concerned. Only we have to reach out to the industries and we have to uh, uh, propagate or uh, market our services uh, so that uh, we can help them, we can help the society and industries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Thakur. So we have uh, Dr. Rishikesh Pawar from uh, Fisheries, scientist from Fisheries. So I would like to ask him that you have been extending your um, fisheries to the local uh, fishermen, right? Using uh, like uh, you are the bridging gap between the scientist and the local fishermen. So, uh, so how what help you will require from CSIR and I O so that you will reach out to more to the locals effectively. For the bridging, whatever new technologies are there from the skill development. Skill training can help uh, bridge the gap between the uh, new technologies which are developed and uh, between fishermen or fish farmers. So that will help like we are expecting from the skill training. Uh, we will uh, train our the fishermen or fish farmers to adopt the latest technologies. And that can be, uh, we can re receive that technology from NAO. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rishikesh. We have uh, Dr. Durbar Ray, who is um, expertise in um, uh, pollution studies. So, uh, from several years, uh, we have been doing pollution studies. So, can we define like different areas in the coast, Indian coast, to say whether we can put up some recreational projects or whether they are safe for uh, doing fisheries? So, can you elaborate on this? Actually, as far as Indian coastline is concerned, uh, there are different category of, of environment is uh, existing. Uh, starting from uh, very, uh, uh, some coastline which are getting influenced by uh, many uh, major cities, uh, waste, uh, whatever domestic waste or industrial waste, those are also uh, affecting those, uh, those coasts. At the same time, some coasts are there, uh, those are uh, very rarely polluted because of those kind of contaminations. So, uh, uh, recreational activities, as far as recreational activities, some, uh, some areas are like Goa. Some, uh, those, uh, those are tourism, is a very pronounced tourism is there. So, uh, their recreational activities are, are more. Uh, coastal and that that's why coastal water also get affected because of those uh, re recreational activities and otherwise some coastline also getting affected due to agricultural runoff also agricultural runoff those contain some chemicals some like fertilizers and uh, all so those also getting affected uh, now some recent study also it is showing in, uh, based on even SGD, uh, those also is telling it is slowly going towards the coastal oceans and it, it is affecting those uh, those area. But uh, uh, even some um, coastline is there, there are some because of some uh, resource, this thing exploration that also getting affected because of uh, exploration. So this type of different kind of Pollution, this thing is there and different part of the Indian coastline. That is a, that is a known fact. Hmm. That services and scientific knowledge base of the science. Hmm. Yeah, see, uh, you all given the assertive statements are known facts. So I request the NIO, CSR NIO, to come out with some empirical data and give us early warning signals. See, Govan waters are, you know, because of the tourism, it is polluted. But still, 
we want to know whether these waters are safe for promoting tourism something like that some through some empirical data you should be able to give us warning signal that's what the question was and you give us the status we want a, a different uh, version of answer from your side right so am i audible yeah ah. so if you need that kind of that is a first of all it is a vast coastline and we need for the selected sites acha for particular site ha ah, for particular site nio can monitor the water quality in details and pro that provide that uh, some information That's as well as as well as already some data is existing with nio uh ah, so those data also very useful to predict what the status of the en environmental status of particular site our institute has done uh, for 35 years so we can collaborate integrate promote with coastal water health map so that, that 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 can be that can be done this of fishing tourism whatever it is yes any more <laughs> So uh, thank you uh, very much, all the panelists. It was a very fruitful discussion. I am sure that uh, this event has um, uh, uh, bridged the gap between the scientists and all the industry people. May I now uh, request Mr. Ari Shripada, Senior Principal Scientist, CSR NIO, to uh, place a closing remarks of this event. Uh, good evening uh, to all. Uh, we we are now coming to a end of the session, uh, means I connect event. Uh, first of all, I thank you all for joining uh, in between the late, although it was late, start, lately started half an hour. I thank you for your patience and also joining with enthusiastically uh, in spite of your uh, this busy schedule. Uh, first of all, in the in the initial talk, initial in the inaugural address, uh, directors, director CSR NIO, Professor Sunil Kumar Singh, he, he addressed the need for testing of the uh, testing of the products uh, to be environmentally safe and the role key role played by NIO in this regard. Uh, Dr. Mawa Saha, a principal scientist, she is expert in the microplastics. Uh, she she informed the what sort of what are the types of microplastics and what sort of what is the danger arising of the microplastics in the food chain, especially in fisheries and uh, other uh, other products like cosmetics, uh, the things. So there is a lot of enthusiasm and a need to collaborate uh, with Dr. Mawa Saha's work. Uh, especially with uh, Dr. Vinay Kumar and uh, his company. So, so I think uh, Dr. Thakur and uh, Thakur is the leading. Uh, he's a technology person, transfer technology person in the NIO. So, I think we we'll, we should be able to take it to a next level, uh, where where we can able to extend our uh, scientific knowledge for the betterment of the industry as well as for the betterment of the society and environment as uh, as a whole. Um, so it is. It is very interesting. It was very interesting talk lecture by, by very specific as per my our requirements exactly meeting by Mr. Avik Seal. He highlighted the need to change to to to, to modify the uh, environmental impact plan, uh, in environmental management plan and uh, EIA report. So he also hinted. He, he also hinted that he is like he would like to collaborate with NIO uh, to to write a better EIA reports or better uh, better EMP plan, which are implementable and uh, it can be manageable and it can be monitorable. So to thank you, um, thank you, Avik. Uh, you actually exactly meet the met the uh, what is the requirement of our uh, whole uh, the iConnect event on this topic. Um, there was a talk from uh, also I also there was a talk from the, Dr. Samir Damre. He highlighted the expertise available at NIO in monitoring the uh, contaminants enter into the uh, 
uh, enter into the marine environment uh, we had a, a discussion with uh, more discussion with oil spill dispersant testing protocols so these are all the chemical dispersant dr magda is interested to know the bio, biotechnological tools to uh, to 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 measure the and qualify the oil spill dispersants how it can be qualified to be used or not to be used uh, that's correct mitigate uh, mitigate mitigate uh, in this direction uh, we also working for some bioremediation products which are herbal based so those those are the results are very encouraging uh, so that will be also be added into the next uh, level of uh, discussions um, there was uh, uh, yeah, probably. Uh, okay, sorry. There was another talk by Dr. Dr. Vinay Kumar uh, on Tigrin, this one. So, it's interesting to note that uh, is such a product is available. So, NIO will, will be, NIO would be happy to, NIO would be happy to collaborate uh, with, with this company in, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, he is company uh, uh, company to if he wants to do any test uh, test or he has to call you he has to certify any of your products by doing online uh, by doing laboratory scale as well as the field level de field level demonstrations we can do so we are with you uh, i think i i, I touched that dr prabhadevi highlighted the oil spill dispersion testing protocols um, so as a as a whole, the the session was very interesting and uh, fruitful. Uh, we hope that immediately we'll turn this uh, discussion into a next level. Um, maybe that in 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 a week's time or ten days time, we'll just discuss brainstorm. So this is the one. I thank you. I I think yeah. Thank. You. Thank you, Mr. Shripada, for giving uh, closing remarks. Now I request uh, Dr. Rakhi Khandeparkar, Principal Scientist, CSIR NIO, to put vote of thanks. It's my pleasure to propose vote of thanks for this event, ICN 70B, which was about testing of products for marine environmental safety, including marine litter. A big thank you to our director, sir, Professor Sunil Kumar Singh, CSIR NIO, for guiding and encouraging us throughout. Thank you, sir. I extend a hearty thanks to the theme director of E3OW, Dr. VM Tiwari, director CSIR NGRF for his valuable remarks. Thanks to Mr. Heman Kulkarni, senior principal scientist and head TMD CSIR for all the encouragement during this event. I would like to thank Sri Are Shripada, senior principal scientist and coordinator of this event. I genuinely appreciate the wonderful plenary talks, and for that I thank Dr. Prabha Devi, Dr. Mahua Saha, Dr. Samir Damre, Mr. Vinay Kumar, and Mr. Avik Sil. I express my gratitude to all the panel members for sharing their expertise and views with our audience. Thank you, Dr. Mandar Nanajkar, Dr. Shivakumar Magda, Dr. Durbar Ray, Dr. Rishikesh Pawar, and Dr. Narsia Thakur and Dr. Mahua, thank you all. I sincerely acknowledge efforts of my colleague, Dr. Supriya Tilvi, for comparing this event. I would like to extend my thanks to NSTC team and our technical, technical team, including Dr. Ettesh, Mr. Ryan, Mr. Akshay, Mr. Jay Singh, Mr. Manoranjan, Mr. Subhanan, and his team, and Mr. Kaulekar for rendering all this technical support throughout for successfully carrying this event and streaming it live. I thank staff of director office for giving all support required. Thanks to all our passionate team of students. Without their efforts, we, will not, we would not have been able to do this. Their efforts are appreciated. Thank you one and all who are attending this event online and offline. Thank you. Jai Hind.